most Americans do this. Without a second thought. But just 20 minutes outside of New York City, in Mount Vernon, you'll find sewage backing up into people's homes. This is what the basement looks like. That bubbling there is water coming up out of the sewer. And it's not just a Mount Vernon problem. All throughout the United States, inadequate sanitation disrupts people's lives far too often. Today, more than one million Americans don't have access to complete indoor plumbing, which means they might not have running water, or they could be missing a sink, or a flush toilet, or a shower. And it's a problem that disproportionately affects communities of color. Black and Latino households are nearly twice as likely to lack indoor plumbing as white ones. Native Americans, nearly 19 times more likely. So why is it that in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, some people can't access something as fundamental as safe and reliable sanitation? Sewage systems have been around in some way, shape, or form for thousands of years. And societies without proper sewage systems quickly learned why they're needed. For example, in 1854, a cholera epidemic killed hundreds of people in London's Soho neighborhood. The outbreak was later traced back to a single water pump contaminated with sewage. Waterborne diseases also reached the U.S., which faced its own outbreaks of cholera and typhoid in the 19th century. American cities gradually improved sanitation by building centralized sewers and treatment plants. And by the end of the century, most major U.S. cities had some form of sewage system. Sanitation progress continued into the 20th century. In 1950, 27% of Americans didn't have complete plumbing. By 1970, that number plummeted to just under 6%. And in 1972, the Clean Water Act was passed, making funding available for wastewater infrastructure. But racist policies often excluded people of color from this progress. For example, in 1954, the city of Zanesville, Ohio, built a water line that stopped just short of a predominantly black neighborhood called Coal Run. This is a map of what water access looked like in the area. Households with water access are shown in blue. Those without water access, located primarily in Coal Run, are shown in gray. Black citizens in Coal Run spent decades requesting access to the water supply, but various government authorities denied those requests all the while granting access to white residents on the same street. Another example, throughout the 20th century, California's farm worker communities didn't receive the same level of investment as wealthier, wider urban areas, leaving them unable to become official incorporated cities with their own local governments. So when infrastructure funding became available in the latter half of the century, these unincorporated communities weren't eligible to get a cut of that money. Yet another example, in the 1970s and 80s, the U.S. passed landmark environmental laws that funded massive upgrades to water and sewage infrastructure. But Native American nations were not initially eligible for this funding, and they still face barriers to accessing funds today. Making matters worse for excluded communities, the funding landscape for sanitation upgrades has shifted significantly. In 1977, the federal government played a huge part in helping communities pay for their water and wastewater systems. But when communities who were left out tried to catch up nearly 40 years later, the federal government had basically moved on. This is Veronica Reyes Ibarra. In July 2019, Veronica received a letter saying that she may have been infected with a potentially deadly parasite called strongyloides. And she wasn't the only one. 15 of her neighbors received the exact same test result. To read that you're positive for a potential deadly parasite was extremely scary, not just for myself, but for the whole community. Veronica and her sister Monica live in a tiny Texas community called Rancho Vista. Rancho Vista doesn't have sewer lines and instead relies on underground septic tanks to collect wastewater. In theory, that wastewater is supposed to degrade and seep into the ground. The problem is, the soil in Rancho Vista isn't right for that kind of system, which leaves residents to deal with sewage problems and the health risks that come with them. Researchers studying Rancho Vista believe the Strongyloides cluster is related to sanitary system failures, 
Veronica's sister, Monica, says these issues have been ignored in their community because it's predominantly low income and Mexican-American. It's really hard to think about these conditions happening in a middle-class white neighborhood. Like this would never happen. Residents of the majority black town of Mount Vernon, New York, have faced similar sanitation issues. Daisha Torsha has seen raw sewage regularly flood her home for about 10 years. You work very hard to have a home and having consistent sewage problems, it really impacts my quality of life and oddly my sense of self-worth. It's a pretty common problem in the city because its wastewater runs through 100-year-old clay pipes that strain under the pressure of the population. Damaged sewer lines can cause sewage to back up into basements and flood homes like Torsha's. <laughs> Sanitation problems aren't going unnoticed by policymakers. Mount Vernon, for example, recently received an unprecedented $150 million in state funding to overhaul its sewer system. And through the bipartisan infrastructure law, new federal funds are available for wastewater infrastructure improvements. The Biden administration has promised that disadvantaged communities will get their fair share of the funds and recently set aside $154 million for Native American tribes. We don't yet know whether these investments will be enough to close the gap in sanitation conditions, a gap created through a long history of racist policies and funding shortages. But what we do know is that a basic and critical service that most of us take for granted is something more than a million Americans are still fighting for. <laughs>